Hello and welcome to another episode of Trust Check with me, Hajara Husseini. Trust Check brings you weekly reports on viral claims made on and off social media that garnered a lot of reactions. Before we get into that, let's take a quick break. Welcome back to Trust Check. The spread of fake news for most people is not intentional, but the urge to be the first to break a news causes the continuous spread of fake news as a lot of individuals fail to check with credible sources or experts before sharing information. And just like spilled milk, wrong information shared can hardly be retrieved. On this episode, we're going to take on two claims. The first claim was made by Nigeria's president, Muhammad Buhari, at the last ministerial performance review retreats of his administration, which took place in Abuja recently. He claimed that almost 39 million Nigerians have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, which accounts for 35% of the total population targeted for vaccination. In verifying the claim, Trust Check found out that in 2020, the World Health Organization had warned that Africa could become the next epicenter of the pandemic, noting that the outbreak might likely kill at least 300,000 people in Africa and push nearly 30 million people into poverty. Data from Worldometers show that as of 24th October 2022, almost 632 million people are diagnosed with coronavirus worldwide with over 6.5 million deaths. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, only over 266 cases have been confirmed, with 355 deaths recorded in 36 states, including the FCT. Following the recommendations of the World Health Organization, Nigeria has set a goal to vaccinate 40% of its population before the end of 2021, and 70% by the end of 2022. However, According to the website of the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, only slightly above 45 million Nigerians have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 as of October 16, 2022. The executive director of the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Faisal Shoaib, explained that the federal government plans to vaccinate all eligible populations of 18 years and above, including pregnant women, but has so far failed to meet its targets. The total number of eligible persons fully vaccinated is 27.7 million at the end of 2021 and as of August 2022. The figure represents only 40.3% of the total eligible population. Let's take a break and when we come back, we'll bring you our verdict. Welcome back to Trust Check. Relying on available data, Trust Check can confirm that the claim made by President Muhammadu Buhari suggesting that 35% of Nigeria's eligible population had been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 is inaccurate and the correct figure is 40.3%. The second claim is a widely accepted belief that big eaters cannot be affected by ulcers. What you should know is that ulcers are sores that are slow to heal. They can take many forms and can appear inside or outside a person's body from the lining of the stomach to the outer layer of the skin. There are different types of ulcers, but today we'll be focusing on the most common type, which is the peptic ulcer. According to headline.com, peptic ulcers are sores or wounds that can develop on the inside lining of a person's stomach, the upper portion of the small intestine and the esophagus. The most common type of peptic ulcers are gastric ulcer, which develops inside the stomach, esophageal ulcers which develops inside the esophagus and duodenal ulcer which develops in the upper section of the small intestines. In some cases, one person can have both gastric and duodenal ulcers at the same time which is known as gastroduodenal. The most common cause of gastric and duodenal ulcer is H. pylori because it affects the mucus that protects your stomach and small intestine giving room for stomach acid to damage your stomach lining. Although it is unclear exactly how this bacterium spreads, researchers believe it's mostly through unclean food, water, and eating utensils, and spread through saliva. Many people get this bacterial infection as children, but start seeing the signs when they get older. Also, overuse of over-the-counter painkillers, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, and other anti-inflammatory drugs can lead to ulcers. Others are heavy alcohol consumptions, psychological stress, smoking, untreated stress, and spicy food. Many people with peptic ulcers will not have symptoms, while others will. Some of these symptoms are bloating, 
belching, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, and chest pain. In severe cases, it can lead to vomiting blood, trouble breathing, feeling faint, unexplained weight loss, and appetite changes. Joining us today on the show is Dr. Agbo Ebuta, a family physician and the Vice President for Medical Initiative for Africa. Welcome on the show and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, Nigerians. <laughs> thank you very much. So before you joined us, we were just talking about the peptic ulcers and how big eaters think they shouldn't be affected by it. Can you please enlighten us and the audience about peptic ulcers? Well, peptic ulcers are ulcers that are related to peptic is the word from spin, which is basically an enzyme that um, finds it secreted in the stomach. So ulcers in the stomach and in some part of the intestine, the GIT and all that, that are related to activity are actually called peptic ulcers. Even if historically they are called peptic ulcers, it's not like at least they are caused by the peptin, which is a digestive enzyme. The etiological factors at the, at the causative factors are things that encourage activity, inflammation, and erosion in the intestinal tract. Most commonly, and in the first part, the small intestine among the duodenum. So if people are abusing certain drugs, like uh, pain medication, diclofenac, and naproxen, and meroxicam, uh, piloxicam, all those pain medications, these have a tendency causing obstruction in the different parts of the, of the intestine, more commonly the stomach and the duodenum. In fact, research has shown that 4 or 25 percent of the ulcers that are treated by patients can be pain medication for other conditions like knee pain with pain, headache and all of that. However, there is a bigger culprit that has published over 40 years ago the direct theological factor that is a positive factor of peptic ulcer. And this etiology or this positive factor is actually a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Now, Helicobacter pylori finds its way into the stomach and maybe the duodenum. And while there, stimulates the rotations of the stomach of the duodenum, the lining of the stomach or the duodenum. And over time, the irritation causes inflammation. And this inflammation, just like many acrid cells, develops loss of the skin or the cell lining within the stomach. And that loss of cell lining is called the ulceration. Definitely, there are other factors. There are some kinds of tumors or a couple of other things like stress, use of other steroids. Um, those are some medications that are all contributing. Yes, being well-fed or overfed does not protect you from ulcer. It doesn't at all. However, a patient who has ulcer or has been exposed to risk factors, whether he's fat, lean, or medium, will still present with the doctor. But the chances of preventing everything and also for patients who maybe are also fat. So patients who have ulcer tend to present more during the period when they are fat because the acid production from the stomach irritates the ulcer. 
or or irritate the duodenal cells or the duodenal uh, lining and cause the symptoms that patients present with. So being overfed in our like in our opening this person or being well fed in itself is not a, a preventive factor uh, or protective factor so to speak for uh, also is strictly so, and uh, the other thing about us that we probably would need to know is that there are some standard presentations and some uh, um, flyer presentations. The standard presentation is that students usually will present with comfort and pain, typically of a burning nature in the part of the stomach that overlies the stomach. The, in the part of the abdomen that overlies the stomach or the duodenum. This discomfort may be burning or maybe numbing. And most times, because it is driven by high activity, once the patient takes something to neutralize the acid, which is antacid, there is some significant resolution of the center. Thank you for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate your time. We'll take a quick break and when we come back, we'll take the rest of the segments for today. On today's segment of Need to Know, we'll be discussing what violent discipline does to children. What comes to mind when you hear the words violent discipline? Violent discipline is the most common form of violence experienced by children in Nigeria. While it is important to teach children self-control and acceptable behaviors, many teachers, parents, and caregivers rely on the use of violent methods to punish unwanted behaviors to encourage what is right. This choice of discipline may induce some form of harmful behaviors in children, giving the increased potential for physical injuries, as well as adopting coping mechanisms to alleviate their distress. According to UNICEF, 85% of Nigerian children between the ages of 1 and 14 experience violent disciplines in schools, with nearly 1 in 3 children experiencing severe physical punishments. Researchers have linked physical punishments with long-term disability or death, poor mental health, impaired cognitive and social-emotional development, school dropouts, and poor academic and occupational outcomes, increased antisocial behavior, aggression and criminal behavior in adulthood, as well as damaged relationships through intergenerational transmission. Just recently, the Minister of Education, Malam Adamo Adamu, endorsed the action plan and roadmap for ending corporal punishment in schools, in line with the Child's Rights Act passed into law in 2003, protecting children's rights to a life free of violence. He noted that globally there is evidence indicating that corporal punishments in schools had impaired negatively on attendance and learning outcomes. To curb this trend, the development, coordination and implementation of intersocial norms, strategy to end violence against children, including child marriage and other harmful traditional practices, should be supported. There is also the need to ensure that children in humanitarian situations have timely and sustained access to quality, preventive and responsive child protection services, and strengthen the birth registration systems to scale up the registration of children under the age of five and focus on children under one. The UNICEF's Child Protection Program, which aims to provide preventive and responsive interventions for children who are victims of or at risk from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation, should be strengthened to further reduce the percentage of child violence in the country. While we bring you weekly reports on false information circulating on and off social media, a simple way to stop the spread of fake news is to verify any information before sharing them. Always remember that fake news causes damage with irreversible effects. For more details on the fact check, visit www.trustcheck.dailytrust.com and follow us on all social media platforms at Trust TV News. Until I come your way next week, I am Hajara Husseini.